David 503. And David 808. This is Two Pastors. Popcorn. And a movie. Hey, before we dive into our conversation, and I shed some more tears, um, we have a question we like to ask all of our guests, and, and the question is this, uh, when you go to the movies, what's your go-to popcorn that you like to take into the theater to enhance the movie-going experience? If I if the movie's like just so-so, then yeah, we have to fight over it a little bit because then I'm like, well, I might as well eat, you know? But yeah. when, when it's a great movie, um, I am pretty much look over and the popcorn's gone and I'm okay with that. <laughs> All right. It's a good choice. Butter, regular butter, regular popcorn with butter. That's right. Lots of salt. Well, let's dive into our conversation. I think, Dave, you got an opening question. Yeah, uh, let's talk about the movie that you have coming out, Someone Like You. It's a movie that offers hope. Uh, it has some twists and turns to it. And we must admit, we you know both cried a little bit. There was a lot of dust in the room at the time. And in fact, it, it basically, I mean, it caught my attention that there's over 500,000 frozen embryos, even as we speak. But we want to ask you, where did you come up with this storyline? It's a beautiful moment. I fell in love with London Quinn in high school, even though she told me not to. If you're driving, I'm picking music. Yeah, so I was speaking at an event about five years ago, and this woman I was talking to had three little triplets running around. And I told her they were so cute. And she said, yeah, she said we couldn't have kids. So we adopted uh, three embryos and implanted all of them, and they all took. So here we are. And I was like, wait, what? I, I didn't even know you could uh -huh. an embryo. I didn't know that was a thing. And of course, there are now. I know. I now know. There are centers all over the United States and even all over the world where if you can't have a baby naturally, you can go and rescue an, an embryo. You can choose that option. So it just, it just started, you know, when God gives me a story, it's like the nugget is there at first and then he colors in the picture and it lands on my heart like a movie. And so that's why there's a fulfillment here that's so exciting because it really is, it's, it's all him. Life can feel serene. And then a single rock breaks the surface. I think we met a few years ago. You had attended a Soul Surfer pre-screening at Lloyd yes. Center Cinemas. And Kevin Downs and Bobby were there and we met. Uh, so I, if I understood right, you lived in Vancouver and since moved. How has moving to Nashville chain, uh, impacted your family, uh, life in general, and your creativity and your writing, uh, having made the you know, Washington's beautiful, obviously. It's, I mean, it's like heaven. It's such a beautiful place. Yeah. And it was a wonderful place for me to write. I wrote most of my 70 books were all written in a little room off of our bedroom that had all windows and just all that rain. That was great writing weather. Yeah. Um, but as things went, you know, as time went on and I knew that I wanted to get more involved in film and even in touring, Nashville was the most obvious place to come. And when we got here, the creativity here, I, I felt like, I had truly come home, like these were my people. And I probably spent maybe a year thinking, ah, oh, we should have found it sooner before I just let go of that and said, let's just enjoy it. You know, we came in, in 2011, kind of before the rush. Oh, yeah. And yeah, so it's been amazing. Love it here. Wow. You know, you've written all these stories and things like that, but it seems like you're starting a new chapter with this production company. Tell us about that and why you started it. Yeah, you know, it was, it, we hit a point about two years ago where I had seen a lot of my stories made into movies or TV shows, and each of them were beautiful in their own right, but they never quite captured, like, the movie in my head. And, you know, the way I, I learned along the way that the only, you, even if you write the script, like, the only way you're really going to see that movie be what, I, I mean, if you want to have a say over costumes and sets and locations and casting, you get for it. That's, like, the only way to do it. And we had a an investment that was coming to fruition. And it reminded me of like, you know, a major league baseball player. They released that fastball, it goes over home plate. It's going flying hundred miles an hour. And the batter has about a half a second to decide whether to swing. Me and my husband looked at each other and we said, this is our moment. This is this half second moment. And every day when we turn in for the night, we walk past a sign near our bedroom that says just one life. And that was kind of what drove it. It was like, we don't want to get to the other end of this journey and say, I wonder if we would have been brave. I wonder if we would have been courageous and taken this crazy step and spent all of our savings, you know, on a movie that everything could go wrong, um, but we could trust God and go through it. We didn't want to have that. We wanted to make that decision, swing the bat. 
and see what God would do. And on this side of it, I am absolutely thrilled we did. London. Sending ripples through all of time. You spoke a little to the process, but your process of writing versus going into production and not just with another production company, your production company. I mean, uh, what was that transition like? And was there, whoa, this is so much more than I realized. Were there any of those moments? Oh, oh I mean, you know, David, we have those, we, those moments happen to us every day, multiple times a day where we're still like, had we known this about it, you know, would we have been that brave? Because it was so, we don't have a clue. We'd have a clue what we were doing. We didn't know. And, you know, I knew how to tell a story. I mean, I knew what I wanted it to look like. And I remember we found our DP. He was a friend of my son's. They were both young filmmakers, you know, doing short films and things. And I knew my son who had his training, his, his uh, BFA in directing. I knew he was ready, mm. even if he didn't think so. He's 30. He was ready. Um, this DP was also a young guy. And Real and just beautiful cinematography. I knew he was capable. And I said, look, Trevor, here's here's the thing. Somewhere down the road, we're going to be at a premiere or a showing or a screening. And I don't want you to watch it and say, it's so good, but I wish we would have had this lens. I said, I don't know lenses. I don't know sound. I don't know any of it, but you do get the best one, get it now. Even if that meant something else had to go. So we had a low budget. It was a $2 million movie. You know, we, we didn't have a lot to work with. But, um, you know, along the way, here's what we prayed. We prayed for wisdom and we prayed for favor. And we literally prayed that consistently because wisdom, because we know nothing. We have no ability to do this. It's beyond our ability, which is fun, right? When it's, when you yeah. know you do, I know I can write a book, but I, this was way over my head. And then the favor, because certain things like your weather and the health of your actors, and we were under COVID compliance from, you know, Screen Actors Guild. So, you know, those things going right, that was only going to be God. There was nothing we could do to make that happen. And it did. And it was just uh, beautiful. I felt like we were walking, you know, running at times, like straight toward the Red Sea of filmmaking. And God kept parting the water. It's been a hard year. So many I'm so sorry. Dawson, you deserve to know. London was an in vitro baby. We couldn't get pregnant. You know, I've worked on about 65 marketing campaigns with my other job and um, watch a lot, a lot of movies. And this one was engaging. And there were turns on, I said to myself numerous times, I didn't see that coming, um, <laughs> which is what I really enjoy about films that there's predictable elements of the movie, the story. And then there's things that you don't see coming. And then you're like, oh, could it go this way? Maybe, maybe it'll go a different direction. And, uh, that really pulled me into the story and um, I felt invested in the characters and, you know, bringing, bringing me to the point of tears when they fa faced some of the situations they faced. So the procedure gave us two embryos. What about the other? We gave it to a doctor who works with infertile couples. Saying London might have a sibling. My wife's a big fan and now I'm a big fan. Uh, she's read your books and things like that. And I just wanted to ask you, because when I asked her, what's so special? And she said, it's the way Karen weaves scripture and uh, talk of God in the storyline. Why is that important to you now? Well, you know, we were raised in a denominational faith that where we just didn't really have a relationship. I certainly never opened a Bible. And in my mid-20s, you know, met this guy who I've now been married to for 35 years and he was just, you know, he was this guy doing solo flex commercials in LA and not doing the party scene. So when we met, we met at a health club working out and I felt like he was this great guy, but then he had this weird habit of reading the Bible, which I just thought was the weirdest thing. You know, um, it wasn't until about a couple of months, months in that we just kind of, he wasn't trying to change my mind. I just had sort of like my beliefs, whatever that meant. And uh, finally, I thought I need to get a Bible so I can de just debate with him and have discourse with him and went to the to a Christian bookstore for the very first time, got a Bible. They gave me a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and I began to read and it took about 10 minutes for me to hear God's voice saying, well, you can either fall away with all your man made beliefs or you can grab onto me and never let go. And I grabbed. And so, you know, I'm kind of an evangelist that's wrapped up in a novelist, you know, uh, kind of work. And that's really what I do is I, I want my books to make an impact and to change people's hearts, to bring them hope. And um, 
it's important that the faith element isn't just patched on. So I never think here's the lesson I'm going to teach that doesn't ever happen in one of my books. God gives me the story and I'm discovering it as I'm writing. Like I'm, I'm crying when I write the books. Like I, and my husband will walk by and kind of give me a look like you're making it up, you know? And I always have to say, I don't feel like I'm making it up. So, you know, a, a secular author can do a good job. Like a Nicholas Sparks, I mean, they can write about physical, intellectual, and emotional aspects of a story. But for me, I get to write about all of that in a way that isn't gratuitous, but get to include yeah. the spiritual, not afraid of it. So because I'm versed in it and I spend time with Jesus every day, I can write about the person running toward God or away from God, the one wrestling with questions or wondering why God abandoned them. I'm, I'm comfortable with writing about all of that. Hi. Uh, can we talk? Who are you? Why didn't you tell me? You were born for me. That's so hard to explain. You talked a little bit about the production side of it, but I would imagine there might have been some times when you grew weary and it's like, gosh, what are we doing? And you you did allude to that, but do you know what 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 helped you to push through that and to just okay, other than okay, we have bills to pay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what pushed you forward just on the the creative side? To, to get to the end yeah it's been like a marathon that's what we keep reminding ourselves it's like you know we can look back christmas feels like yesterday right so if i go forward that many months this is behind us and win or lose you know we've given it we've done this we've got a beautiful movie in the final version we're so happy with it and the score everything about it so we're on mile marker 25 you know at this point but at times it was mile marker 17 or 19 and there were times when you just didn't really want to go to the laptop because the next hundred emails would be coming through. And since we didn't have a lot of cash and we weren't taking money from investors because that comes with decision-making power. And we wanted this movie to be the one that God gave us the story he wanted us to put on the screen. So we used a lot of, um, I would say relationship equity that through my years, you know, either as a person, just being a, a, a donor um, or a friend or a partner with different ministries and organizations, places that sell my books, places like Compassion International, Liberty University, American Association of Christian Counselors, like, um, you know, we Hobby Lobby, we, I know the people who run these and already have that relationship. Mm -hmm. So it was a matter of coming alongside and saying, hey, you know, we're going to be made whole quicker than someone else. So can we do like a profit share. Can we, can you come alongside us and we'll give you money later down the road? And they trusted me enough to say yes, but that meant managing a lot of people and a lot of emails and, you know, emails now it's, I think 180 a day that we're getting coming through, but it's, we're almost there. And, um, you know, we, April 2nd is around the corner. So we're, we're feeling like all that time and effort worked and I don't know how you replicate it down the road, but we would give it a try because it's been a lot of fun. One of your organizations, and I must admit, I've ordered some of these cards. These are the cards that you leave when you're getting coffee or something like that. Explain that foundation and what those cards mean to people. Yeah, so that foundation is called You Were Seen. And do you know that we, that's our one of our companies as well, yes, You Were yes. Seen. Oh, fun. Yeah. So what happened was we were, my husband and I were at a restaurant in O'Hare airport and this man, Henry was our waiter. And he was probably in his sixties. Like you have to look at Henry and he's doing a phenomenal job balancing five tables, but you have to look at him and go, obviously this was not the dream for Henry to be working at a steakhouse at O'Hare airport in his sixties. And I watched him and I, I do study people. I mean, that's part of the, you know, that's part of the writer in me. I have empathy and compassion for people. I think um, God wants me to look deeper. And so I watched him when he went off the floor and he really, like, he looked like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders, but I couldn't do anything about it. Like we're leaving. I can say, God bless you. And I can leave him a good tip, but you say, God bless you when you sneeze. So that wasn't going to be enough. And at that point, this was maybe seven years ago. And I felt like God was pressing two things on my heart. One, make a movie and two, do something about Henry. And so I told my husband, I mean, I literally had tears and he said, like, are you thinking about a character? And I said, honey, I'm thinking about Henry. Like, what are we going to do for Henry? How do we, all of our lives, all of our life, all of your life will intersect with somebody else's and just for one moment. So for that one moment, I get to be around Henry. And if I don't know, if I'm not ready to help him, then what, what for Henry? 
And so uh, we, I went home, I told my family, I said, these are the two things. And some of the kids said, let's make the movie. And I said, you know what, let's do this. You were seen first. Let's do this first. And my husband was in agreement and let's see if we can't come up with something. So we contacted Billy Graham's website, like Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And we said, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. You have help links for every problem. You have a 24 seven prayer line and you have a, a plan for salvation. That's sterling. Why don't we just partner with you? And they said, yes. So the card leads you to an interface website you were seeing and the message simple. I just carry the cards, carry some extra tip money. And if I see you, you know, and you're the, you're the police officer I run across or, you know, the, the pastor, the barista, the guy behind the counter, I just say, you know, I just want you to know you were seen by me today, but you are seen by God every day. And I give them the card and, you know, grown men cry over that, like that somebody would care to say right. you were Sorry. seen it is just the most, it's the most beautiful way to go through life. You you can live your life on mission by just carrying, you know, for three bucks, you can get 10 cards and you can, you can really change somebody's life or save it. It was yeah, you're making me cry. Because, um, my wife and I had this conversation about a month ago and she said, you know, if we got rich, if we got money, what would we do? And so she named some charities that she would give to. And I said, you know, I would really like to just, bless the server or you know if i run across somebody and do this and it was like two days later i ran across your foundation that does that and then mm -hmm. we discover you're releasing a movie and then we get in contact so it was just wonderful oh. that, that it was for us it was a god moment and so i did order my cards but i'll tell you know the pastors and other people that are watching this and i'll put the website on the screen but when you go there you can actually order just 10 cards or you can order five thousand cards so it is an amazing way that you could activate your whole church and it's all right there and i love that it sends them to as you said billy graham foundation because this person may be working two jobs here in hawaii we have a lot of two and three job people that they don't have time you know for sunday service and so we we reach out to them in ways we can and maybe they go on a wednesday but this is the way that we can reach out to them in just uh, about 10 seconds Put it out there so thank you you know that you were welcoming to god when he did that do i look like london I'm home. yeah when you're writing and you said that you can you know write a, a story in about uh two weeks or something like that but i imagine there are a lot of people out there that wonder where is karen writing so what is a a typical writing day <laughs> look like for you how do you come up with the different ideas or where are you sitting yeah we um you know there were times when I would love to go travel to go write. Like I love writing at the beach and obviously we're landlocked here in Nashville. Everything else about it's great, but I could use a beach or two. So what we, what I've been doing lately, cause we, you know, now we have little grand boys. And so if they stop by, I don't want to not be here. I can't, and I don't want to be at the beach. So what I do is go into a dark room and I turn on the TV and put on like a YouTube 10 hour beach clip. Like I can go to the Bahamas or Fiji or wherever I want to be. And I literally, you know, the, the, it's the people, I don't know who these people are, but they've made these clips and I can be virtually then at the beach and I'll put on some instrumental music, first half of the book instrumental, and then I can listen to lyrics and it wouldn't bother me. But first half, just make a playlist that kind of feels like the score of that movie in my head and then do my writing there. So it's um it's not super glamorous, but it's just enough to separate me from the everydayness of life, so that I can get into that other place and and fall in love with the story. Hey, during production, to understand that you started production, um, you know, beginning with prayer and committing the whole production to to the Lord. Um, during production, do you have some examples you can share with us where God showed up, or it's like? And that was that was just a miracle, and didn't expect it didn't expect that to happen, but God showed up. Oh my goodness, so many! Yeah, I mean, pre-production we had at our house, which was off and different and weird, but the team came, you know, prepared to be able to understand that it was different. We fed them well, and I did a little devotion every morning, like before we started, and divided up into our different teams. Once we started shooting, then that was Tyler's job. Tyler, the director, who's our son and who was ready for that job. I put headphones on, stayed at Video Village, and I alternated between praying and being just so proud of him because he did such a good job. Um, mm -hmm. But it was him then praying. So he prayed. So anyway, along the way, yeah, we had 
I mean, the weather was one thing. We only had 25 days. Like we had Lynn Collins for four days. We had Bart and Robin, you know, Bart Johnson and Robin Lively only for five days. So you, everything, no one could get sick. Like nobody, there could be no problems. Every location had to be ready for us. And it always just like perfectly worked out. That thing you say about movies is that they try not to be made. But in this case, it was like, he was, you know, God was letting it do everything it could to be made. And um, we only had rain twice. And those were days that we were shooting at the cemetery. So we'd get there, the rain would stop just before we shot and everything would be glistening and wet and the clouds would be gray. And it was like, okay, we, we would have had to have spent, you know, six figures to make it look like this. And God did it for us. This is incredible. Were you in love with her? You can't bring her back, man. You talked about buying the right lens and the right equipment and stuff like this. Does this mean that there's going to be more movies in the future? Well, we rented, but yes, <laughs> um, absolutely. You know, our team is excited. We've had one preliminary meeting about like which story would be next. And I think some of that will depend. You know, we think someone like you is going to just take this country by storm. The interest has been phenomenal. Like the, the yeah. trailer viral everywhere we're so happy so you know if it does well enough um you know i'm in a good partnership with my distributor that will will be able to make another movie and maybe we'll make the one that has the world war ii flashbacks that's on my heart that would be amazing i could stay here forever she's not ours she's not london it was so much fun <laughs> well we always like to conclude with a prayer pray that someone like you will reach the masses because we look at it as a two year, you know, two million plus the marketing cost. It's, a, it's like a sacrifice that we're laying at the Lord's feet. And at this point, really, we've released it. We've turned it into our distributor and it's totally up to God what's going to happen next. So we're praying that it will reach the masses with a message of hope. God, we, we commit it to you and we ask for your blessing as you've already shown, but continue to bless as it reaches around the world. And we, uh, we thank you for Karen, pray for her family, for protection, for guidance, for wisdom as they move forward. And we pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Thanks for being on Two Pastors Popcorn and a Movie. Uh, Someone Like You hits theaters April 2nd. You can go to someonelikeyou.movie for more information to find a theater near you. Um, Karen, we just appreciate your time for being on the podcast today. Uh, God bless you. and. All the best. Thanks for joining us for Two Pastors Popcorn and a Movie. We enjoy talking about movies and shows that are coming to a theater and or streaming. We'll be back next time with more incredible interviews and movie news. And amazing information. Popcorn. Want some more popcorn? I would love some more popcorn. Take some more popcorn. Yeah, let's go get some more popcorn. Okay, we'll see you later.